you're here. We want to welcome everyone watching us by live stream. To our Elevate family, we love you. We miss you. We hope to see you soon. To those of you who are watching us by live stream and you are not part of our Elevate family, we are very honored to have you uh, watching this message. And we believe that it's a divine appointment that God has called you to watch this word that's going to change you, that's going to impact your life, and we believe change the course of your destiny. And we really believe that. So we're doing a series called Hot Mess. And we're in a hot mess. I don't know if you know that. The world's been in a hot mess for a while. Everything's all over the place. And one of the things the Bible is very good at, the Bible is very good at defining and showing us how to get through a hot mess. There's a lot of people in the scripture who are in very difficult times. And one of my most favorite stories is uh, David. David is a guy who constantly found himself in difficult seasons. Some of them were created by other people, and some of the seasons that David uh, had in his life, he created them himself. So David, through his choices, it was good, bad, and ugly. And we're going to look a little bit at 1 Samuel chapter 30. And David has been anointed by God to be king. So there was another guy who was king at the time. His name is Saul. Saul is still in the position as king. But the Lord has given the spiritual authority and the spiritual right to become king to David. Saul has lost it for various reasons. But David has been anointed to be king. He's anointed to a position of leadership in God's, God's kingdom. Anointed to a position of leadership among God's people. All of this has gone on. And the moment he became anointed, everything went sideways. Right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? The moment you stepped into God's purposes, everything blew up. Everything just opposed you. So David is called. He's anointed and he's called. And he, through a series of circumstances, David's circumstances just kept getting worse. It got worse. He's being chased. He's running around. And the thing that tipped David over is David went to his family in Judah and his own family betrayed him. His own family betrayed him. And most of the Psalms, if you're really into Psalms and you say, does God understand how I feel? Read the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is called the book of psychotherapy, right? There's a lot of feeling and a lot of emotion in the book of Psalms. There's anger, there's pain, there's despair. And the majority of the Psalms were written by David. David was an experiential follower of the Lord. David didn't follow the Lord by decrees. He followed God through experience. And so David would experience these pains. He would experience God's goodness. He would experience things about the Lord. And he brought forth the reality of God, not based upon something that he had learned about the Lord, but something that he had experienced with the Lord. So it's a very interesting uh, person in the, in, uh, in the life of David. So he is, he's, a, he's betrayed by his family members, and David abandons everything. Those closest, he would write in the Psalms, if my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will not forsake me. How could he write something like that? Because it, the, his own household had forsaken him. His own family members, his own tribe was trying to turn him over to Saul. Saul was trying to kill him. And David's hiding in Judah, thinking that his family and his tribe is going to protect him. And they betrayed him. Anybody been betrayed by people close to you? Yeah? If you've been betrayed by somebody close to you, Jesus understands. There's, there's an understanding point of reference here in the Bible. Jesus was betrayed by someone close to him. Judas betrayed him, right? Hello? What did Jesus not withhold from him? What did Jesus withhold from him? What did Jesus not do for him? And yet Judas chose to betray him. Through a series of circumstances and betrayals, David just abandons everything. And you know what he does? He goes and lives with the heathen. He goes and lives with the godless. So for three years, David leaves and goes and lives among godless people. He doesn't just live among godless people. He lives as a godless person. This is a person who's anointed to be king. God has called him. He's had encounters with, with the Lord. He understands God. This is, he doesn't know about God. He knows the Lord. But he allowed the life circumstances, it, the things in his life, to drive him from his faith rather than into it. Circumstances will either bury you or they will build you. And the choice is up to you. It's up to you. You can allow the circumstances to, to bury you and, sur and surrender you, or you can allow the circumstances to cause your faith to rise and you can press in. And David had a really bad moment here. And he forgot the Lord for three years. 
That's what happens. A lot of Christians, they get born again, they get on fire with God, and they start going forward and going forward and going forward. And then all of a sudden, life hits them. They get betrayed. Maybe it was a divorce. Maybe it was a loss of a business, and they think God doesn't love them, and they start believing a lie that God is actually perpetrating that upon them. That's a lie. Everything that is good and perfect comes down from above, from the Father of lights. If it's not good and perfect, say it with me. If it's not good and perfect, it didn't come from Jesus. This thief, that would be the devil, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and more abundantly. If it's not abundant life and it's not good and perfect, it does not come from the Lord. But people believe that, and they allow the circumstances to drive them to these places, and they go back to living the way that they used to live. They go start hanging out with their friends. Well, just like David, you're going to see David. It doesn't profit him at all. He's living with the godless. He's living as the godless, and David became lost to himself. He forgot who he was. Kind of mirrors the story of the prodigal son, doesn't it? The prodigal son takes off, and he came to himself, the Bible says. When the prodigal son came to himself, when he had an awakening, wait a second, why am I living among the pigs? Why am I eating hand to mouth? My father is wealthy. My father is kind. My father is merciful. He may not accept me as his son, but he will accept me as his servant. Therefore, I'll go to him. That prodigal son had a wrong belief about the Lord. He never lost his sonship, ever. It's a powerful story. And the key moment isn't just when the, when the prodigal returned. The key moment in that story is when he says, I have, I have sinned against heaven and you, and I am no longer, he, couldn't even, he, he was not allowed to deny his identity. The Lord accepted the repentance from the, from the, from the boy. That's the mirror here, is it's the Lord, is the, is it the Father. And so the, the, but the Father accepted the boy's repentance, but he never allowed him to lower his identity. He was not allowed to call himself, he was not allowed to say he wasn't a son. Read the story. He said it when he was in the pit, this is what I'm going to go and say to my father. But when he got before the father, the only thing he could do was repent. And the father let him repent. Repentance is healthy. Repentance sets your life back on the right track. And so th the mirror here is that God will receive the repentance, but he will not allow you to lower yourself beneath the standard that he has called you to. You can do it. You can live a life that's beneath the standard, but the Lord will never see you beneath the standard that he has established. If you were a daughter, you were a daughter forever. You don't ever lose that identity. You don't. You're going to see this is exactly what happens to David. He goes and he lives with the godless, and he's living in a city, say, with me, Ziklag, right? Ziklag. And if you look at what that word means, the word Ziklag means wrong vision. David is living in a city of wrong vision. It means built low. David is living in a city that's built low. David is building his life too low. A lot of times people, I was sharing this with my wife in the car as we were coming to church, I said a lot of times people misunderstand God's anger in the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but one of the reasons is, is they misinterpret what he's angry about. He's not angry about their actions. He's angry because they lowered themselves. If you find where God was angry with the people, right? And so if you're a Christian, you need to know this. He will be angry with you no more. Isaiah 54 says, he will be angry with you. If you are in Christ, there is no anger. But in the Old Testament, when God was angry or better yet, frustrated, because that's really the tone, when God was frustrated with his people, it wasn't because they were smoking, drinking, and chewing and hanging out those th with those that were doing. It was not their actions. It was their willingness to lower themselves beneath the standard that, that, that he had established. They constantly lowered themselves. They would worship other idols. Will you abandon me, the fountain of living water, and drink from cisterns? He would say that to them over and over again. I Israel, is Israel a home-born slave? Why are you in bondage? Because you lower yourself to serve the cultural idols. You are serving the idols of the culture. And because you serve the idols of the culture, you are a slave. I never told you to be a slave. I never positioned you as a slave. I never, that is never my identity for you. But, but through the course of your actions, you have lowered yourself and allowed yourself to become a slave. And he would be very frustrated with that. Anybody here have children? Anybody at home have children? If your child flunks out of school, does that bring you honor? Did you raise that child to flunk out of school? Of course not. When a child lives beneath their potential, as a parent, that is one of the most frustrating things you can ever experience.
particularly when you've invested time and energy into that child. You've given so much for that kid, and then you watch that kid lower themselves. You had to fight to get yourself out of the hole. Can I get a witness? Right? You had to fight. You had to have a street fight, several of them, to get yourself out of the position that you found yourself in. Now you establish a family. You raise children in a better environment than you have, and then your kids kind of constantly want to lower themselves. What you fought to get out of, your kids want to go back to. You know what I'm saying? Anybody experience that? I mean, I've raised two adult children. <laughs> I know it. What I fought to get out of, my kids want to go back to. I'm like, what? Wrong vision. Built low. You know what else Ziklag means? This is crazy. I was telling this to Sherry because I was reading. I was, I was doing the word study on this, and I'm really, I like to pull words apart. And so I was really pulling this word apart. It, one, of the, one of the word pictures is it says to push the palm against the forehead. And I thought, oh, that's weird. So what does it mean to push the palm against the forehead? And then I went like, oh, that's what it means. And so Ziklag is a place where you go, oh. David's in a place, and he's about to go, I've built my life too low. He's in a place, and he's about to realize I've had the wrong vision. Some of you, you need to put the palm to your forehead and recognize that you have built your life too low. You need to put the palm to your forehead and realize that you have built with the wrong vision. You are building a life apart from Christ, and you have the wrong vision. You are lowering your identity, and you are accepting standards that he never told you. You lower yourself. David loses everything in a moment, doesn't he? In a moment, David lost everything. He's living with the godless. He's living as godless, and in a moment, he loses it all. While he was away, raiders came to his town. He was living, again, he's not in Israel. He's with the heathen. While he was away, a bunch of people came to his apartment, stole his Xbox, stole his flat screen, took his wife and kids with him too, and stole his, his, stole his mozzie that was sitting in the driveway. In a moment, everything that he had was taken from him. And not just him, but all of the people that were following him. And so what happens, they all show back up in town and everything's gone. Your wife's gone, your kids are gone, your car's gone, your Xbox is gone, your flat screen's gone, your guitar's gone. Everything's gone. Whatever you value, it's taken from you. You have nothing in a moment. And the Bible says that all of the people wanted to kill David. <laughs> it keeps getting worse. Now David was greatly distressed, 1 Samuel chapter 30. The people spoke of killing him. They're all like, oh, man, this is, I don't know what to do. I don't know what, to, I, man, it's his fault. Yeah, I think it's his fault, too. What do you think we should do? Well, I think we should kill him. And so David is here in the midst of loss, and he's in the midst of, again, everyone is turning against him. He has nowhere to turn. Nowhere. And this is one of the most often quoted verses in the Bible. We quote this verse a lot. We have to understand the context that this is coming out of. And it says, but David strengthened himself in the Lord. Anybody ever heard that verse? Right? It's a very common verse. David, David encouraged himself in the Lord. David, the word isn't encouragement. The word is strengthened. And it means he bound himself securely to the Lord. It meant he held fast to the Lord. He grabbed hold of the Lord. Everything is teetering. Everything is out of control. David is at a tipping point of all of his losses. He has nowhere to turn, and he grabs hold of the Lord. That's always the right move. Grabbing hold of Jesus is always the right move. Jesus is always the right answer. So David, everything, he's losing everything. This is what's going on in our economy. You know, you're going to see in the next six months, we're going to recover. It'll be the great American comeback. But there will be losses in between the comeback. People will lose things, unfortunately, because of the circumstances we find ourselves in. And they won't know where to go. There may be somebody watching right now, and you're just willing to say, is there a word for me? There is. Take hold of the Lord. Everything was teetering, everything that was, everything that was lost. And you know what David did? He struck himself on the forehead. He's in Ziklag. I've built my life too low. Why am I living this way? Yeah, I'm partying with my friends, but I'm living like a pig. There's some people out there, you're doing the same thing. You're a Christian, you're a believer, you, but you party with your friends and you're back in the pig slop all the time. 
you're dating the same boyfriends, you're dating the same girlfriends, you're in the same places, the same po with the same people, and you're constantly finding yourself in the pig slot. Ziklag, your wrong vision. You're building your life too low. You need to have a Ziklag moment. This is David's Ziklag moment. Everybody do this. Boing, boing. And so David's about to lose everything, and he's like, what do I do? What do I do? These guys are going to kill me. And he goes, boing. And he said, the Lord will help me. This is a powerful moment. David calls Abathar the priest. Now, I want you to get this, okay? David has a priest with him. He's living with the heathen. He's living like a heathen for three years of his life, but yet he has a man of God with him the entire time. Nowhere in the scripture do we see David call upon the Lord in those three years. Nowhere, except this moment. Nowhere in the scripture do you see David ask for Abathar, the priest, in any other moment. At any moment, he could have he had an intercessor with him. He could have said, Abathar, inquire of the Lord. Ask Jesus. He could have said that at any time, and he didn't. But now he does. So he has Abathar come. But watch this. This is very interesting. Ahimelech's son. And he tells Abathar to bring him the ephod. David takes the priestly vestment, which was not allowed for anybody to wear except a priest. David was a king. There was prophets, priests, and kings. They could interact. A king could prophesy, but a king could not operate as a priest. A priest could prophesy, but a, king, but a, pro, but a prophet couldn't operate as a king. There, those, those, there was an isolation on the role of a king. A king, could not, a king could be a prophet, but a king could not be a priest. Yet David puts on the vestments of the priest. He puts on the ephod. Why? Because God, David accessed something through experience. He accessed the priestly ministry because David was a worshiper. David understood that through relationship, I can penetrate the heart of God. And if I penetrate the heart of God, there will be extraordinary things available to me that common people cannot have. That's the truth. Saul couldn't do it. Saul lost his kingship. You know why? Because he was trying to operate as a priest. There's, among other things, the main, Saul's main problem is he couldn't follow a simple set of instructions. So he could not manifest the authority of his position because he couldn't follow a simple set of instructions. There are so many Christians that cannot follow a simple set of instructions. And you cannot manifest the dominion of your, of your destiny. You cannot manifest your identity because you can't follow a simple set of instructions. You do it your way. Frank Sinatra Christians. I did it my way. <laughs> I think Saul wrote that song. He calls for the priest, he puts on the ephod, and he steps into position as a priest. And he begins to minister unto the Lord. What's significant about that is the ephod was made of linen at this time. They, they turned it into a vest when they built the temple. But at this time, it was made of linen. It was a linen vest that had precious stones on it. You know what birthstones are? Okay? It had, everybody has birthstones. You know where the birthstones come from? The ephod. The 12 birth stones were on the ephod, and they represented the 12 tribes of his people. Each stone represented one of the tribes. God would wear the tribes close to his heart. I carry you with me always. It was made on linen. Why was it linen? Because my, my ability to carry you is light. I don't sweat when I carry you. I don't sweat when you're near my heart. That's the whole point of the linen, was that I don't sweat. Linen was to show no burden. Guess what? If you're a minister... The priests in the Old Testament wore linen, which means we are to bear the burden of the Lord without complaint. We are not to, we are to represent to the people that we, to, to, to serve Jesus isn't a task. It's easy. That's our, the ministry of the Lord is not hard. So many people complain, well, just got to complain, got to serve Jesus. No, you've been given linen. You don't get to, you don't have to serve the Lord, you get to, and all of his people are priests. Our service to the Lord is an honor. It's not a burden. And so David inquired of the Lord with the ephod on. So it had gold, had gold on the shoulders and it had onyx and it had the 12 stars or 12 stones. The, the gold on the shoulders, gold was his goodness. Onyx represented truth. I bear your burdens in truth. I bear your burdens in goodness. It was all symbolic and all representative to them. David takes this place. He comes before the Lord, and he wears covenant attire. You understand that? You want to get God's attention? 
A lot of people want to get God's attention. Wear covenant attire. David came in his full identity. Come before the Lord in your identity. You want his attention? Don't come like a beggar. He does not recognize you as a beggar. He recognizes you as a son. He recognizes you as a daughter. You come on your knees crawling. That's the modern church. We want to talk about this lamenting prayer. Every time there's a lamenting prayer in the Bible, God says, stand up. Read it. Every time. Lament. Get on your feet. Job's lamenting. What does he say? Stand up like a man. David's lamenting. What does he say? Or, or Joshua's lamenting. What does he say? Stand up. Every time. Does it, I always use this as an example. Parents and your kids in the store and they're begging for something and they're throwing themselves on the floor and they're going, oh, mommy, you don't love me. You don't love me, mommy. Is that an honor to you? Jesse, you got small kids. So when they throw themselves on the floor and they start, they start crying in the grocery store and start telling the world, my mommy doesn't love me. She won't let me get the G.I. Joe, my mommy who doesn't love me. That's no honor to her at all. It's no honor to the Lord when we lay on the floor and roll around and cry. <laughs> Rend your heart and not your garment. I get it. But this weeping, lamenting, sackcloth and ashes almost never got God's attention. He, he doesn't want sackcloth and ashes. He wants you to stand before him in the vestments of your priesthood. He wants you to stand before him in the covenant attire of your sonship. That's what he wants. David stood before the Lord with the covenant on, and he said, Lord, I remember your covenant. I remember now. I strike my head. Oh, my gosh. I had a ziklag moment, Lord. I built too low. I've had the wrong vision, but now I've come to myself, and I come to you in my covenant attire. Do you remember me? That's what he's saying. I remember you, Lord, and I remember now who I am. I am not this person. This is who I am. And I stand before you clothed not in my righteousness but yours. I come before you not as a servant of Ziklag, not of the servant of the Philistines, not as a worldly man, not as a worldly God daughter. I come before you as a God man. I come before you as a God woman. Do you remember me? And what does the Lord say? The answer is almost immediate. You want an answer from the Lord? Put on covenant attire and take your rightful place. Stop begging. Stop crying. Stop ignoring him. Stop living among the heathen. Repent. Return. That's what David did. First time in three years, David, David returns to the Lord. And you know what he did? He recovered everything. You know what David is saying here? I have, shall I pursue those who have taken what is rightfully mine? Shall I pursue them? And what's the Lord say? Absolutely. Go after what's yours. Go after what rightfully belongs to you, and if you will pursue it, you will overtake it, and you will gain it back. That's exactly what David did. If you're a believer, there's nothing that is lost to you that cannot be regained. There's nothing that has died to you that cannot be resurrected. We carry resurrecting power. No matter what's lost, if you are willing, it will, you can raise it again. No matter what you've lost, if you will pursue what is rightfully yours, you will obtain it. David didn't just obtain what was his, these raiders, these Amalekites, had been raiding all of the villages around. And so David didn't just get back what was his. He got back everything that they had taken. So he got double portion, triple portion, sevenfold portion, whatever the Amalekites had. Yeah, he got back his family. He got back his flat screen. He got back his mozzie. He got back all the things that he lost. But he also got everything that they had stolen from other people. Yeah. Yeah. The spoils to the one who dares. David calls for the priest, puts on this thing, calls to see if Jesus still remembers him. And Jesus said, man, I've been waiting on you, bro. That's how people are. Do you still remember me? Put on the linen ephod. Put on the vestments of your identity. You are a priest before your father. Come before your father as a rightful son, and he will recognize you. He recognized David immediately. And listen, so you know, David was in a bad place with bad people doing bad things. But what David did right is he called upon the Lord. You understand that? It wasn't an issue of David's behavior. God didn't go, well, when you stop doing those bad things, hanging out with those bad people and going to those bad places, maybe I'll listen to you. David was in a bad place with bad people doing bad things. And he called upon the Lord. And the Lord demonstrates his faithfulness to David, not because of David's actions. 
He demonstrates his faithfulness to David because David understood the concept of identity. David understood the concept of position. And God recognized it. This is where it is, Christian. You want to know how this kingdom works? I'm telling you. If you think the kingdom works another way, then you practice common Christianity. Common Christianity doesn't work. Look at our churches. Are we the salt of the earth? Do we, are we a world changer? We feed the poor, pastor. So does the United Way. The United Way feeds the poor. The Red Cross feeds the poor. Why are we exceptional? Because we feed the poor. Should we? What are you saying? We shouldn't feed the poor? No, I say we should feed the poor. But we should be facilitating a lot more than just feeding the poor. We are the city on the hill, not the Red Cross. Did he say the United Way will be the city on a hill? But if, if, if common Christianity works, then why aren't we? Because it doesn't work. The product that we are, we are producing is flawed in its manufacture. If I produced an iPad and I gave you the iPad and I told you that this is supposed to work and every iPad I gave you didn't work, but I kept claiming that it worked, would you say that the problem is yours or would you say the problem is the, is the people that are making it? The church is called to make disciples. And if we are not producing the correct disciples, there is a problem in our manufacturing process. We are not doing something right. The problem that happens, and this is church leadership, if you're a church leader, do not stop the stream. If you're a church leader, what happens is we don't want to look at us. It has to be someone else's problem. It couldn't possibly be the church's problem. We're doing everything right. Are you? Are you? What is the product that we're producing? Are we producing world changers in this hour? Look at the church. Where are they? Where are the leaders of the church? In living rooms. That's where they are. Where are the people? If Jesus comes today, where is he going to find you? Well, I was, you know, oh, I had to bow to the coronavirus, you see. I had to be safe. You don't know the gospel. I, people don't know the gospel. The gospel never promises you safety. There's this message of safety. Where, can you show me that in the Bible? There is no promise of safety in the Bible. None. None. It talks about losing your life, laying down your life, being faithful unto death. Nowhere does it say, make sure you're safe and sound. It doesn't say that. We, we, preach, a, we preach another gospel. That is not the gospel. Of, oh, you're offending me. Well, I'm sure I am. Where there is no challenge, there is no change. If you are not challenged and offended, you will never change. Ever. If someone doesn't tell you you're, 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 you're doing something wrong and it offends you, you'll never change. The Bible says rebuke an arrogant man and he will hate you. Rebuke a humble man and he will love you. So if, it hate, if you hate the fact that somebody is telling you a truth that you don't like, you're arrogant. <laughs> I don't like that either. Well, then, you, dude, you better do business with Jesus. David remembers the covenant, takes his rightful place. We should be saved. What are you trying to say? We shouldn't be saved. Listen, you need to use wisdom. The problem is not whether you come to church or whether you protect your health. The, the problem is the attitude of God's people. The attitude of the church in this hour is more reflective of the culture than it is of the kingdom. That's the problem. So whether you come to church and stay home, that, that's not the issue. Wear the mask, all that stuff. Wash your hands. What were you doing before? I don't know, but we're all washing our hands now. <laughs> kind of scary to think about that. Were we not? We, I mean, we have to watch videos to show us how to wash our hands. Everybody's doing video. I'm like, do, do we not wash our hands? I'm like, what, what's going on here? The question is not your actions. The question is your attitude. There's people, Christians are more reflective of CNN than they are of the kingdom. We parrot the fears that are being spoken to us from the culture. And I'm here to tell you that might bother you. Me saying that, that might bother you, but you need to do business with Jesus. You are in this world, but you are not of this world. You are, you are to transform your thinking by the renewing of your mind. You are not to think along the courses of this world. Again, that's Bible. You, we are not to think along the courses of this world. We are to think along the courses of the kingdom. And people go, well, I don't know the courses of the kingdom. That's step one. Learn the courses of the kingdom. Learn the heavenly language. Learn the heavenly mindset. Learn the language of faith and the language of the spirit. That's step one. Just a thought. <laughs> Preach it. Somebody. I got one. I got one. 
Eight of you are walking out the door, one of you is staying. That's all I need. When you live this way, it leads to inevitable losses. God lost, David lost everything, but he asked the Lord and God gave him wisdom. If you ask the Lord, he'll give you wisdom. You need wisdom, he'll give it to you. You need counsel, he'll give it to you. David had to have the courage to follow. So what David does is he returns, okay? Everybody say it with me. Return, receive, and obey. That's what he did. He returned to the Lord. He asked the Lord a question. The Lord instructed him, and then he did it. We can return to the Lord and receive instruction, but still never do what he told us to. Can I get a witness? That's what stops our lives as believers. One of the things that stops our lives as believers is God has told us what to do, and we have refused to do it. And so your life is stuck in 2002 because in 2002, Jesus told you to do something and you never did it. He told you to take that course, to build your life, to do whatever, whatever he's told you to do, whatever change he told you to make, whatever direct instruction he told you to give. You haven't done it. And you wonder why your life's stuck in a moment. You wonder why your life is stuck in 2012, 2015. We'll go back to 2015. What did he tell you that you haven't done? I asked the Lord for wisdom, and he doesn't tell me anything. Then ask him, what have I not done that you have already told me? Ask him that and see where that conversation goes. The communal life of obedience sets the course of blessing. And so from this experience, David was able to write the Psalms. And one of the Psalms that David wrote was Psalm 5. He says, for you, O Lord, you bless those who are right before you. With favor, you surround them with a shield. If you are right before the Lord, favor, say with me, because I am right before the Lord. I am not right before the Lord because I am such a wonderful person. I am right before the Lord because I have received Jesus. Right. And if you've received Jesus, you know what the Bible tells you? Blessing and favor belong to you. It does. Say this with me. Favor and blessing will always make me superior to my circumstances. No matter what, sir, this is David writing this. How did David know that favor and blessing makes him superior to his circumstances? Because David experienced bad circumstances. He called upon the Lord for favor. He called upon the Lord for blessing, and he became superior to his circumstances. Not because David was so wonderful, because David called upon the Lord. Who was right before the Lord? Bible says, he, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So how are we righteous? We're righteous because of Jesus. That's important to know. We become righteous because of Jesus. He says he surrounds them, right? He surrounds them with favor as a shield. Favor is your shield. You know what the word surround is? It's the Greek word, and it means encompass. Literally, all points of the compass, whatever direction you go in, if you're walking with the Lord, you will find favor. If you go to the north, you will find favor. If you go to the northwest, you will find favor. If you go to the northeast, if you go to the south, it means encompasses. All points of the believer's life are shielded with favor for those who walk with him. That's a fact. That's a fact. Favor and blessing makes you superior to your circumstances. There's a lot of bad circumstances that are happening in our world right now. And what you need to do is you need to call upon the Lord, put on your vestments, take your rightful place, and begin to receive and operate in favor and blessing. And I'm going to give you some practical points in here. And it doesn't matter. You say, which direction did I go in? Get positionally correct with the Lord, and it doesn't matter if you go to the north. You'll find favor. It doesn't matter. There are things in the Bible that are absolute. Okay, so the Bible's black and white on a lot of things. There are other things that it just gives you a direction, just says kind of go in that direction. Then there are other things in the scripture that basically says whatever you want, according to your heart, according to what you want, what you seek. So, so there are things that are absolute. There are things that are, this is a pretty good idea. This is don't do this, don't do that. This is the better idea. And then there are things that say it's up to you. Favor will follow you in the direction that's up to you. Which way do I go? doesn't matter. You'll find favor if you walk with the Lord. David wrote, and he knew by experience, he needed, he always already, if you're a Christian, you're already blessed and you're already favored. You don't have to earn it. It's yours. You have to activate it. Say it with me. Blessing and favor is mine in Christ Jesus. I need to learn to activate it, right? It's like a light switch. That's what activate. When we turn the light switch on, it gets activated, right? 
Electricity is flowing through these lines, but so long as the switch is off, the power is not activated. Can I get a witness? Okay, so power, blessing and, blessing and favor is yours. It's like this light without the power on. You need to learn to activate the blessing, activate the favor, and manifest it. Manifest it is to be made known. What is true in the spirit to be made known in the natural. That's what the word manifested means. Jesus manifested himself. The word became flesh. That is a manifestation. That is the spirit coming into the natural. The bread came down from heaven. That is a manifestation of, the, of what is true in the spirit to be made known in the natural. So we as Christians, we activate, we turn it on, we turn on the favor, we turn on the blessing and activate it, and then we make it known. It manifests through our lives. He presented himself before the Lord. He clothed himself in covenant attire. He called on the Lord. He listened and he obeyed. He had the wrong vision. He had the wrong vision. He was in Ziklag, built too low, built with the wrong vision. What do I do? Build it again. Build with another vision. Second Corinthians says, we all with unveiled faces continually see in a mirror. He's looking in the wrong mirror and are progressively transformed into his image from glory to glory, all of which comes from the Lord. Anybody look in mirrors, right? Mirrors show you what's going on. A mirror will tell you if you're having a bad hair day, right? A mirror will tell you a lot of things. Mirrors reveal your shape. Real, regular, re mirrors reveal your figures, right? What the Bible says about itself is that it's a mirror. It mirrors to us our figure. It mirrors to us our emotional figure. So the Bible would say this, people that are in fear and running around and have massive amounts of anxiety. Does the Bible ever command us into fear? Come on, somebody. No, never. So why am I in fear? Because it's mirroring to you that your emotional state is not in line with the kingdom. And there's a lot of tools and mechanics that need to be corrected in order to bring that into order. But my point here isn't the tools and the mechanics. My point is to simply show you how the Bible reveals your emotional figure. People that are afraid or anxious, be anxious for nothing, right? It sh what the Bible's telling me to be anxious for nothing. Why am I anxious? Because now it's revealing to you an emotional state that is not congruent with the scripture. It reveals to you a spiritual state. It tells you that if you don't know Jesus, you're lost, you're hopeless and helpless. Reveals your figures of speech. Can I get a witness? The Bible says, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. And we're, it's showing me, wow, my words are not right. I'm talking in the wrong ways. I say a lot of corrupt things. I say a lot of negative things. I gossip. I backbite. Don't gossip. Don't backbite. That's what the Bible's telling us. Dude, let's speak only what is good and what is pure. It shows you your figure of speech. And it shows you your position, what you're acting like a son, whether you're acting like correctly before the Lord. David was looking in the cultural mirror. He was reflecting his life by the mirror of the world around him. And this is what believers oftentimes do is we reflect our lives or we let the world mirror back to us who we are. And because David let the mirror of the culture speak to him, he saw himself as beneath. David just wasn't in Ziklag. David just wasn't living with the heathen, acting like the heathen. He was serving the heathen. He was serving a Philistine king. David is the king of glory. David is the king that represents God's glory. Yet he's serving a heathen king. Why is he doing this? Because David doesn't have his head right. David doesn't have his heart right. David is allowing the culture to tell him who he is and not who God to tell him who he is. God said, you're anointed of God. You're a king. You're going to rule. I'm going to give you a great dominion, David. But because David let the culture tell him what time it was, he lowered himself. The, mirror, the culture will mirror to you hopelessness. Can I get a witness? I'm not encouraging you to watch the news, but if you watch the news, the message is hopeless. It is. Oh, come on. Don't, don't fight me on that. That's not true. Yes, it is. The message, David settled for what was offered to him rather than pursuing what was rightfully his. That's a change that happened in Ziklag. Have you settled for what, what everybody's offering you? Or are you willing to pursue what is rightfully yours? God says you can take the land. What do you say? God says you can have whatever I put in your heart. You can have it. If you can see it and dream it, I will give it to you. Are you willing to pursue it? Or are you willing to settle with what the culture has for you? You can fan that out on any level you want. That is an applicable truth that I just gave you. 
Put that in any category you want. Most of us settle. We settle for what's offered to us. Even though God has promised us something greater, we're willing to settle. If you, and you say, well, I want what God wants, but you're not willing to pursue it. David had to pursue it. David had to risk. David had to risk losing everything. David had to go and fight. He had to fight against enemies to get something that already belonged to him. Can I get a witness? Yes. God gave the Israelites the land, but they had to go in there and fight against enemies to get what was already theirs. The same thing's going on here. We don't want to risk. We don't want to put the effort in. We don't want to make the time, right? Side hustle. People want to get blessed, but they don't want to hustle for it. Well, I want blessing. Well, your nine to five job probably isn't going to take you into blessing. Nine to five, you're not going to get blessed. You're not going to be able to go into that place if you don't have investable income. The only way you, great, you gain wealth or you move to a position of wealth is moving beyond wages and starting using money into investable means. And you say, well, my wages only pay my job or only pay my bills. That's most people. That's okay. It's okay if your wages only pay your bills. You want blessing, you're going to have to pursue it. God says you can have it. And there's tithing principles. There's generosity principles. Those things are tied. Those things are assumed. But if you want blessing and you're believing God for this increase and you're not willing to do an extra hustle in order to get yourself investable income, it's not going to happen. Wages aren't going to pay it. You're going to have to, well, I can only make $500 a month. Well, take that $500 a month and save it. And in a year, you've got $6,000 in a side hustle. Now you've got $6,000 in investable income. In five years, if you just save for five years, put your nose to the grindstone, in five years, you'd have 30. You can do a lot with 30 grand. You can begin to leverage 30 grand. But most people don't want to hustle. Opportunity shows up wearing work clothes. It's true. You have to hustle. That's what David did. You want, you want, what, you want what belongs to you, David? Get your men together. Put on your war garment, get your sword on, get the horse ready, saddle the horse. Man, this sounds like work, Lord. This sounds like a lot of work. If you want what belongs to you, you have to put in an effort. The Bible says he, set, he blesses what you set your hand to. What does that tell you? You have to set your hand to something. He, blessed, he blesses the seed of the sower. What does that tell you? You have to sow seed. You understand that? The cultural mirror says it's impossible. Jesus says possible. The cultural mirror says it's never going to happen. Jesus said it's, the best hasn't even yet begun. The cultural mirror says it's all over. The Lord says it's, it's, good things are coming. The culture says to you, lie down and die. Jesus says, rise up and live. The question is not what these competing voices. The question is, is which one are you going to listen to? Any mirror that is not reflected of God's truth is a distorted mirror. That's a distorted mirror. <laughs> any mirror that is not reflecting, say this with me, any image that I am drawing that is not reflective of God's truth is a distorted mirror. Anything you believe about yourself, anything you believe about your circumstances that is not a reflection of God's truth is a distortion. I'll go further. It's a lie. And you're partnering with a lie. You're believing a lie. I'll never win. Who told you that? Who told you that? It's the beauty of the gospel. All the losers get a crown. The Christian will win if they don't quit. Do not be weary in well-doing, for in due seasons you'll reap if you what? Faint not. You're going to reap if you don't quit. The only, the only predication upon reaping is do what is right and don't quit. If you do what is right and you don't quit, you will have a harvest. And often we won't do what is right or we end up quitting. We start doing what is right. I told the story of a tither, a guy that was tithing. He was believing God for a six-figure income. And that's what I would tell all of you. If you give and you're a faithful tither, attach faith to your, in to your tithing. Attach faith for your income. Put faith behind it. You're not giving to get that, but in the giving, you're believing. God, faith is activated through obedience. And when we obey the Lord, God says he's going to cause your vats to overflow and your barns to burst fruit. That's a promise. This guy attached faith to it. He was believing God for a six-figure income. He didn't get it. He tithed for six weeks, and he didn't get his six-figure income, so he quit tithing. <laughs> then he went and read the Bible, in the, and he was in a Starbucks, and he read the Bible, and he read Ananias and Sapphira. 
And he read how Ananias and Sapphira had made a vow to the Lord and they failed to keep it. And the Lord said, you vowed something to me and you broke it. God doesn't need the money. Listen, let's be clear. If you think God needs your money, you don't know the Lord at all. You don't need, God doesn't need you to give the money, but you need to give it. Giving activates the principles of the spirit in your life. And God was telling him this, not because God was offended that he had broken his promise, but he's saying to him, I can't bless you because you've broken your promise. And so when the guy reordered his promise and began to obey the Lord again, things started opening up for him. He got a job. It was 30000 Say, that's not 100. Wait, it's coming. Next year, his sales doubled. He was making 60000 Within five years, he's making a well over $100,000 a year. Was God faithful? He was extremely faithful. God could not activate the promise in the man's life until he, activated, he operated in consistent obedience. This is American Christianity. We do one thing that's obedient, and we want an award. We do one thing that's an obedient act. Well, I tithe for three weeks, bless God. Hallelujah. Put my picture on a wall. Give me a name on the plaque, on a, on a chair. One act of obedience, really? It's consistent obedience. The consistent obedience is what activates the promises. And then when you attach faith to your obedience, that activates the promises. You cannot allow cultural voices and images to influence you or dictate you. We have to stop letting the culture reflect to the church who the church is. The culture does not define the church. Jesus defines the church. The culture does not dictate to the church. The church is actually supposed to dictate to the culture. Just a thought. We're the salt of the earth. We're the city on a hill. We are the ones that we're not dictated to. We dictate. We're sons and daughters. We bring his world into this one. We bring heaven's government to rule upon the earth. So what do you do? Let me give you some steps. Number one, encourage yourself. Say this. I need to tell me what time it is. If you don't encourage you, I got news for you. If you don't encourage you, nobody's going to encourage you. You get frustrated with other people because you want them to encourage you. I get frustrated with my wife because she doesn't encourage me. She gets frustrated with me because I don't encourage her. Well, I'm not a mind reader and neither is she. We both have learned to encourage ourselves in the Lord. We both have learned that humans have very limited capacities. And so we need, you need to learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. I'm going to show you exactly what happens here. You need to view yourself in the mirror of God's word. You need to view yourself in the mirror of God's spirit. And you need to view yourself in the mirror of God's promises. You are not ordinary. The Christians are not ordinary. Nowhere in the Bible does God ever call his sons and daughters ordinary. Ever. Overcomers. Royal priesthood. Holy nation. Over, over and over again, this is what he says, ambassadors of a kingdom. He doesn't say you're ordinary, you're average. He never tells you to lower yourself. He tells you to take the rightful place, not by exalting yourself, but exalting Christ by taking your rightful position. This is how this stuff works. Jesus has a promise for you in the hour. Obey the conditions of the promise and attach your faith. Attach your, what does your faith say? What does your faith tell you? How big is your faith? My faith tells me this is what's going to happen. My faith tells me this is the way it's going to be. Yeah? What's your faith saying? Is your faith talking? My faith says the mountain will move. My faith says I'm going over and not under. My faith says I will succeed and not fail. Not because my faith is in human wisdom, but because my faith is in the word of God. And my faith is in the promises of God. What's your faith saying? Just a question. I felt like the Lord was telling me today to begin to believe God for some of these heathens to come to Christ. And I can't remember who I told, but my wife said she's going to believe God for Lady Gaga. Yeah. Oh, I said Mark Zuckerberg. I was putting my socks on this morning, and I felt like the Lord said, I want you to believe me. Mark, if you're out there, you need to watch. So somebody email this morning. Mark Zuckerberg, Jesus is calling you. I was putting my socks on this morning because I've been really pressing into faith. I've been, I was born into this kingdom by faith. I come from a church of faith. We didn't come from ordinary. I come from extraordinary, and God is reminding me of that. You were born of the spirit, Kevin. You were born of power. You were born in promise, and you were born with faith. Act like it. You think I say that to you? What do you think I say to myself? Because Jesus tells me that. Act like to who you are. You're a man of faith. Without faith, you cannot please me. Have faith. 
And he's been telling me to press into my faith. And I've been pressing into my faith. And I've been believing God for impossible. Do you believe that the mountain can move? Do you believe? Do you believe? Where's your faith? And I put my socks on this morning and I said to him, I said, I said, man, I just feel like God is telling me to believe God for Mark Zuckerberg to come to Christ. That put your faith on that, Kevin. Put your faith that that guy who is as worldly as they come will come and repent and will become a vocal Christian. Well, he ain't going to do it in 12. I don't care if he does it in 12 years. The, the issue isn't, the issue isn't a time. We, we put timetables on it that God never put. God didn't say 12 months. He said, believe me for that man's soul. No one is asking me for Mark's soul. Will you ask me for Mark's soul? Will you ask God for the people in your life? Will you ask the Lord for your neighbors? Will you ask the Lord for your lost loved ones? Will you? No one's asking for him, and the Lord is looking for someone to ask him for him. Ask me for Mark. I said it to my wife, and she said, you know what? I'm going to believe God for Lady Gaga. And see, I have faith to believe for Mark Zuckerberg, but she said Lady Gaga. I'm like, whoa, good luck with that. So my faith wasn't telling me Lady Gaga, hers was. You understand? What is your faith telling you? What is your faith telling you? My faith tells me this. Relentless faith, passionate faith, pursuing faith. Do you need to change what's coming out of your mouth? David said, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. What did he do? Read that right there. I will what? Say. I mean, you would imagine that most Christians in modern America are mute. We're mutes. Oh, we sing. We lift our hands. But do we say of the Lord? Do we proclaim this? Do we live a lifestyle of confession? Do we live a lifestyle of declaration? Do you? I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. I'm going to show you David encouraging himself from this very psalm. David says this, and for the next 14 verses, he declares and prophesies back to himself. This is a model. This is in the book. God wants you to declare and prophesy. You, we're talking about mirrors. You need to go to the mirror and declare and prophesy to yourself. What are you going to prophesy? Pick this verse up. Pick the, go, go, to Psalm, go to Psalm 91 and read it. Surely, David's looking in a mirror. I want you to imagine David looking in a mirror. I will save the Lord. He is my refuge. And then he's looking in a mirror because he's discouraged. He doesn't know what's going to happen. <laughs> Surely, he will deliver you. He's talking to himself. He's going to deliver you from the snare of the fowler. And he's looking at himself. He's going to deliver you from the pestilence. He's going to cover you with his feathers. He's going to put you under his wings. Your truth, he will be your shield, your buckler, not someone else. He's saying this to himself. David, what? Encouraged himself in the Lord. David strengthened himself in the Lord. What does it look like? I'm showing you. You will not, he's telling himself, he's basically grabbing himself by his shirt and he's looking at himself and he's saying this, you will not be afraid of the terror by night. Are you hearing me, Kevin? You will not. I'm going to tell you, Kevin, right now what is going to happen. You will not fear the terror. You will not fear the terror by night. He's telling himself what time it is. That's going to give you guys a world of good. If you would begin to practice that, if you begin to go to the mirror and tell yourself what time it is, if you don't do it, nobody's going to do it for you. You need to open your mouth and tell yourself this is not what's going to happen. I'm going to tell you what is going to happen, but the first thing I'm going to tell you is what's not going to happen. You are not going to act in fear. You are a son of the highest. You will not capitulate. You will not bow. You will not concede your rightful position in a time of destruction. You will not do that. You will be found faithful. The Lord is watching, and you will be found faithful. You will not embarrass me by you acting faithless. Try that one on. Try that one on. Start telling that stuff to yourself. Start telling you how this is going down. Stop letting the circumstances dictate to you and start dictating the word of God back to yourself. A thousand's going to fall at your side. 10,000 at your right hand. There may be 10,000 businesses that are going to close, but let me tell you something. Yours is not going to close. Your business, Kevin, is not closing. Why? Because the Lord is with you. Will not come near you. Only by the looks in your eyes you will see the reward upon the wicked. You're going to watch the wicked fall, but you're going to be rewarded. That's how this is going down. No evil's coming against you, David. Pull it together. Stop thinking evil's coming your way. He's encouraging himself. Keep all your ways. In their hands, they will bear you up. And then the Lord starts speaking back to him. So he's making these declarations, and I'm telling you what's going on here. David, by making these declarations, finds himself in the spirit. 
to encounter and these declarations, these faith declarations, faith comes upon him and he's in the spirit and the Lord starts speaking back to him. Now he prophesies. He goes from declaration to prophecy. Because he has set his love upon me, the Lord is now speaking. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. The Lord is echoing to him. Because David is making these statements of faith, now the Lord is decreeing back over him. Because you have set your love upon me, I will deliver you. Is that wild? He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will deliver him and I will honor him. With long life, David, God is speaking a prophetic word over him. With long life, I will satisfy him. And with long life, and I will give him my salvation. I'm telling you. You guys want kingdom? This is kingdom. You want a real Christianity? This is real Christianity. This isn't religious Christianity. This is real life-giving gospel. That's what it is. I'm going to finish with a prayer. We're going to do a declarative prayer. We're going to say something. You should go home and you should say 90, not Psalm 91 to yourself in the mirror. You should, if you don't know what to say and you don't know how to tell yourself what time it is, tell yourself Psalm 91. What time is it, Kevin? It's time for Psalm 91. Where are you going? I'm going to the mirror. Yeah, but my family's in the house. Then go sit in the car. Okay? You got mirrors in the car, don't you? Flip down the visor. Look at that dude sitting in the chair. You're in the driver's seat. Yeah, buddy? You're in the driver's seat? Okay, this is what time it is. You are not going to fear. You are not going to faint. You are not going to fail. Tell yourself what time it is. David encouraged himself in the Lord. That's how the church teaches us. Brother, we need to just, and you just need to encourage yourself in the Lord. Kevin, be encouraged in the Lord. No, it's a little deeper than that. It's a little more passionate than that. It's a little more fervent than that. It's a little more direct than that. And it's a little bit more encounter-based than that. Say this with me. Come on, we're going to finish it with this prayer. And I'm done. Say it. <laughs> You are the God of the breakthrough. You are the God of the turnaround. You take what the devil means for bad, and you always turn it into something good. Because you are good. You are the source of all that is good. Your word declares that no weapon formed against us will prosper, and that we will triumph over all of the opposition. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. You are the God who preserves. You are the God who vindicates the faithful. You are the God, here we go, who, who leads us into victory. In every transition, we have victory. In every changing season, we have victory. In every area of our lives, we have victory. You are the God who teaches us to profit. You are the God who restores everything that the enemy has stolen we have nothing to fear because you are with us we have nothing to fear because you are by our side and if God is for us then no one can ever successfully be our enemy you will not abandon us in our times of trouble and you will not allow the adversary to prevail against us your goodness awaits us and we will wait on you. You and you alone will we wait for. Come on. And we will not waver. We now thank you in advance because we know that our God reigns. We now thank you in advance because we know that our God will not fail us. In Jesus' name, we receive all of your goodness and we rejoice and celebrate in your loving kindness. Come on, you believe it? You believe it? Come on, don't you feel powerful? You make that declaration, you're like, whoa, wow, that's crazy, that's pretty good. I like that. So we wanna thank you again for watching at home and we wanna bless everybody here one more time. And we just wanna say that uh, for those of you in your giving, there should be a giving link on the bottom. Your uh, tithes and your offerings and your faithfulness of part of this church is very, uh, we're very grateful for that during, that, during this time and we um, certainly need it so we just want to honor you but we don't need it god will provide but will you give right we don't beg ever but on the bottom of the screen there's your giving link anyway i'm in another zone and i'm trying to come back into a natural thing but god loves you let me bless you may the lord bless you may the lord keep you may the lord cause his face to shine down upon you may the lord be gracious to you in every way and may he give you peace 
And may you forever live within his favor. In Jesus' name. God loves you. We love you. We love you all. Have a great week. Blessings.